really grateful uh, to be here with you today. There are a lot of people in the room, so I hope I will say something useful in the next 20 minutes or so. <laughs> there are hundreds of people who made this moment happen for me, so shout out to mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, uh, and everyone else. Um, the topic of my talk is where we are today with respect to AI in pharma and where we will how will we succeed in the future. Um, so this reminds me of an American classic, uh, The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Uh, often quoted, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And so I'm really grateful to Paul for setting up the stage uh, for how we need to approach AI in the future. Um, many of you open up your browsers, your laptops, iPads, etc. in the morning, and there is a deluge of information about how AI is changing the world around us. And that is the same in pharma. Every morning I receive somewhere in the order of 25 newsletters, uh, competitive intelligence reports, etc. that all talk about how AI is changing. And yet when I look at the number of clinical trials where AI plays a significant role, when I look at the number of drugs that are delivered in the market where AI has delivered impact, when I look at the number of patient journeys where AI is truly helping you get to a diagnosis faster and get better faster, the numbers are incomprehensibly small compared to the universe of pharma in general. So this talk is not necessarily going to be about those accomplishments. There are plenty of other uh, speeches today, uh, and I hope you saw some of them in the previous two days, about AI in clinical trials, AI in digital therapeutics, et cetera, et cetera. So what I wanted to speak with you about is how, what conditions can we create in pharmaceutical industry? If you are in it, that's great. Please help me. If you're working with us, also please help us. So what conditions can we create in pharmaceutical and healthcare industries in order to adopt AI more? and more importantly, to drive more impact from it. So well, I looked at some of the characteristics of previous in, uh, technologies that have been adopted in pharma, and I've also looked at some characteristics of um, industries where AI has been adopted more, and I came up with this very unscientific list of six items. Okay. Um, and we'll go through each of them. Um, for each of them, I also have a call to action to you. And as Paul said, if engineers and scientists and experts don't participate in the political system, we are unlikely to have outcomes that are going to benefit us. Instead, we may have outcomes that limit our liberties, hinder our progress, and make us more frustrated as users. So the first condition um, is that underlying mechanisms, or science in our case, needs to be translatable to machines. How many of you know, or how many of you believe, that in financial services, your credit score algorithm actually follows a pretty decent common sense set of rules? Yeah. And how many of you believe that a person who is in charge of calculating these credit scores actually knows what they're doing? It's, it's debatable, but they certainly know more. <laughs> they certainly know more about how to calculate a credit score then we know and then we are able to translate about how the complement immune system works in your blood. Right? If you're in pharma, you probably know about complement immune system. If you're not in pharma, there's a fabulous two-minute YouTube video that explains it. For example, another example is sodium channels. Sodium channels are involved in transmission of pain between our cells, and we know that they play a role in how pain is transmitted, but we don't know how it actually works. Right? And so if we don't fundamentally know how it works, how are we expected to create conditions in an AI algorithm that will follow those f principles and come up with the right conclusions? Right? So my call to action here is please keep driving science. And pharma is a really interesting world. If you want to change careers, let's talk. <laughs> Um, we also need highly developed ways of working. We talked about robotics earlier, and how are you going to train a robot if, for example, whenever I go to procurement, they tell me to go to six different people and fill out 17 different documents, 14 of which are not relevant to my project? Right? So if we can't explain to ourselves and to our new colleagues how a process works in a company, chances are we won't be able to explain it to a machine either. And so I implore you, thanks to this free image uh, from Google Image Search, uh, to cut out the questions. If these six questions are not answered about a process in your company, please don't try to apply AI to it. Okay? Get some scissors. The third one uh, is an audience participation question. <laughs> 
Does anyone in the room feel like they can name all six aspects of data quality? I was going to big, bring prizes, but being a pharma company representative, not a, not a good idea. So I'm just going to count on your, I'm just going to count on your courage. Anyone in the room can name all six elements of data quality. Precisely. All right. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> um, so there are six elements of data quality, and not only do we not always think about them, not, all, not only we don't know them by heart, um, but we also, when we approach data quality exercises, we approach them in silos, we approach them as one-off, we approach them at the beginning of a really important project, and instead what we should be demanding is that these six quality aspects are checked routinely and automatically whenever data is generated or ingested. I know that there are technology providers at the conference and they will tell you, yes, we can do this. <laughs> so please demand that this is done in your organization. Without quality data, um, we will have gibberish coming out of AIs. And as you know, if you torture the data enough, it will confess to just about anything. All right. Um, the next item is all about people. Uh, I've conducted a semi-scientific exercise with pharma professionals, and I'd like to do it with you here in the room as well. Uh, how many of you have used a website in the last six months? If your hand is still down, let me repeat the question. How many of you, <laughs> how many of you have used a website in the last six months? Very good, all right. I apologize, I should have practiced to say that in multiple languages. Konia koristio website u zadnjih šest meseci. All right, um, so it's an interesting question, right? All of you pretty much raised your hands. So statistically, there should be at least one person in the room courageous enough to tell me what constitutes a website and how does it work? You, you can hear a pin drop, huh? Um, exactly. And so websites have been around for 30 years, according to some people, 20 years, according to others, or 15 years, according to my grandmother. Um, and so if, if over 15 years we have not been able to develop a comfort with standing up and saying, yes, a website is a set of information that is accessible online, usually lives on a server, which is a connected big computer, and I can access it using mobile or computer-based browsers. If we're not comfortable with websites after a couple of decades, how on earth are we going to be comfortable with artificial intelligence? And so my semi-scientific exercise was to ask approximately N equal 300 pharma professional, what is artificial intelligence? And I'm glad that Paul said, well, we don't have to define it for the purpose of politics, but for the purpose of inventing new medications and new vaccines, we most certainly need to understand what AI is. So I asked about 300 pharma professionals, I gave them a multiple choice question too, which makes things easier, and only 50% of them correctly narrowed it down to one of the two correct answers. Right? There was a 50-50% chance that they would get it right, and still only 50% of them got it right, right. And so if we are not going to drive full understanding of what AI is and what it can do, we risk creating AI solutions that drive um, further risks, that come to the wrong conclusions, um, and that ultimately can have significant impact on our health, especially in uh, pharma and healthcare. So what can you do? Whenever someone says, oh, we need to train our people in AI, you first need to ask them, well, which flavor of AI? <laughs> Let's be specific. And also you need to offer a variety of ways to learn, right? Uh, if I were to ask you, are you all the same learning type in this room? You'd probably tell me to buzz off because no, you know, so one person prefers to do it by example, another person prefers short videos, another person just wants to sit with someone and work together in an apprenticeship and so on. And so if you want a massive amount of people to be transformed in terms of their knowledge, you have to deliver that knowledge in a way that is accessible to them. Right? And HR really doesn't like it when I say this because they really just prefer to hire one agency to design one program and then train everybody in it. <laughs> All right, um, so if you do this, McKinsey says you will have up to six times better chance in succeeding in your AI programs than if you just count on people to absorb by osmosis what's being said about them, all right? 
Um, the, a little bit of thunder was stolen from this slide in the previous presentation. <laughs> so thank you, Paul, and thank you whoever asked the, the question uh, about regulations. Um, we need uh, very clear and well-developed regulations in order to stay compliant with them. And as you have heard from multiple sources, uh, regulatory agencies are still composed of humans just like ourselves, who also are struggling to get to know this vast and extremely complicated world of artificial intelligence, what it can do, how it comes to correct or incorrect conclusions, and so on. And so, uh, in a slightly different accent, I implore you to participate in the political process. Um, I can also put on my Eastern European accent if we want to further differentiate from Paul's previous presentation. <laughs> All right. Um, on the next item, and this is the final uh, characteristic, um, in healthcare and pharma, we have a fundamentally different risk profile uh, than in any other industry. Um, if your credit score is miscalculated by a few points, you might not be approved for that store charge card that you've ever dreamed of, um, or your interest rate may be slightly higher on your, um, on your mortgage or, or a car loan. And those are not um, insignificant effects. Those have a profound effect on your life as well. But imagine the effect if um, an AI-designed antiviral drug um, didn't take something into right calculation. And we, even if we start a trial with something like that, phase one, phase two, where it's a small number of people, if we did something incorrectly, it could kill someone, right? Or it could devastate someone's life with permanent disability, loss of function, etc. And so in the picture are my two daughters. Um, the older one is 11, the younger one is seven. And whenever I wake up in the morning and I look at their faces, I remember that in pharma, we have such huge risks that it's almost paralyzing. You almost feel like saying, it's better if we don't do anything. But my call to action here is different. My call to action here is that in healthcare and pharma, because of our fundamentally different risk profile, we have the opportunity to really drive the standards of ethical AI development, right? So we can turn this into an advantage, an advantage that we can then have other industries follow because hopefully the risks are lower there. And so I hope to catch us back up on, on schedule since uh, I'm keeping this brief. <laughs> um, so if you look around you, today is the slowest pace of technology change that we'll experience in our lives, right? Um, and so we really need to be vigilant, resilient, and active in this conversation about defining how AI changes our lives in the future, because our grandchildren, our friends' grandchildren, will grow up in a world where AI, where AI is as common as websites. Right? And we owe it to the next generation to create a universe in which they can feel comfortable with the results that they're receiving and with the information that is shown to them. And of course, with all the benefits that AI could bring in terms of treatments and therapies. So because you probably didn't want to memorize everything that I said earlier today, it's on one slide uh, for your uh, picture taking convenience. <laughs> I'll give you a moment. <laughs> Hashtag AI world. <laughs> Thanks yeah, this is called uh, anticipating customer needs. <laughs> a big, a big cornerstone of you know people. People often come to me and they say, "Oh, digital is all about technology," and I counter that by saying, "No, digital is actually all about people." Technology, to me, is the technology that we used to have back in the '80s when you know, I, in order to you know say hello, you had to put in ten space print. You know, uh, hello, uh, and then repeat until 100 or something like that. And that was technology. Technology was centered around what technology can do. Digital is centered around what people need, what people find useful, what helps people live a more fulfilling life. Uh, and so that's why I, I try to anticipate your need and say, OK, we've got, we're going to include a, a slide with a few words on it. Um, so uh, this is a very uh, quick talk, because I know that there are many other presentations 
applications that will include information about um, a variety of applications of AI and how to do it well. Um, and by the way, at Empathec now is my uh, Twitter if you want to hashtag me with AI World and that summary page, uh, my communications, people will have a field day with that, I can tell you. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. I think that we're back on schedule, Scott. Hey, that was great. And no need, really, you can go longer. <laughs> I love listening to you talk. Thank you. Uh, so, round of applause.